This episode is brought to you by Grokly. Hey parents, is your child struggling with math? Meet Grokly, an advanced AI tutor designed to help kids progress multiple grade levels in just a matter of months. Grokly identifies where your child is struggling, meets learners at their level, and is proving effective even for kids with multiple learning disabilities, ensuring that every child gets the support they need. Grokly currently supports K-5 math but is expanding so that it can meet the needs of your child as they grow. And kids who are hypernumeric or otherwise advanced in math can continue to learn to their heart's content no matter how fast they want to go. It's a fantastic alternative to human tutors and considerably cheaper as well. Try Grokly free for seven days and see for yourself how it can help your child with math. For more information, visit grokly.com. That's G-R-O-K-K-O-L-I.com and use the code the Autism Dad to get your first month for 50% off. Welcome to the Autism Dad Podcast. I'm Rob Gorski. I got a great show for you guys today. You know, one of the biggest challenges uh, for me in this community is getting more dads to open up and share their experiences, their you know feelings and emotions and kind of what this journey of raising autistic kids is like. And I got one for you guys today and he's awesome. His name is Sean Hampton and he's a dad to two autistic boys. And he's here to talk about his personal journey, like the diagnostic process, his personal journey towards acceptance, how he processed everything, and how he has used that experience to inspire uh, the creation of something that is having an impact on a lot of other families like yours and mine. So thank you, Sean, for taking the time to be here. I really, really appreciate it. Could you take a moment and introduce yourself and then let's talk about your parenting journey and, and learn what life has been like for you and your family? Sure. Yeah. First and foremost, Rob, thanks for having me. I've um, been listening to you for a long time, man. I, you're just such a pioneer in this and can't thank you on behalf of not our own, of our own family, but all the autism families out there, man. It's it's great that we have somebody like you that's uh, helping spread uh, all thank the you. information. Um, I'm Sean Hampton. Uh, I have two boys with autism. Uh, we have three kids total. We have a 21-year-old in college, a 15-year-old uh, in high school with autism, and a 13-year-old in junior high with autism. And our story is really um, a lot the same as everyone else's, man. I've, I've been listening for a long time. Everybody kind of has the same story. Ours is no different. Um, our, our youngest was our first diagnosis uh, around two. Um, a lot of the same symptoms, you know, the not talking. You know, we made excuses. He's a boy. Uh, you know, the older kids will just do it for him. Why does he need to even talk? Um, we eventually, you know, got to the point where we had to get the diagnosis for him. And then, um, much like you, um, our kids are so different. Uh, the 15 year old was just diagnosed last year. Um, so he went 14 years, um, with an ADHD diagnosis that we felt we just needed to, to go ahead and get the autism diagnosis for him, um, really. So services and things like that could happen in school. Um, so that's kind of our, our parenting journey. Um, we, uh, often get asked, you know, why does your kid have autism or, you know, what's the reasoning? And uh, we really, truly feel that uh, that there is no reasoning um, other than maybe God chose us because he knows that we, uh, my wife and I, um, are loud people <laughs> and uh, we're persuasive and uh, we fight for what we believe. And um, I think maybe we have our boys to, to uh, for the reasoning of uh, raising awareness and pushing inclusion. Uh, so how, how old were they when you first like noticed that there was something to be concerned about? Like, did you guys notice or was it brought up by the school? It's always interesting to see how that played out. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we noticed things, especially with the youngest. Um, he's nonverbal. Um, he's a little more severe. I don't like to use that word, but um, he's a little more severe than, than the 15 year old. Um, when he was two, uh, yeah, he wasn't hitting the milestones. We took him in for the, the preschool screening and uh, just things just weren't adding up. Um, as a dad, I, I really fought it. Um, I really didn't want to hear those words. I didn't really understand it or know what it meant. Um, and that was really hard for me uh, to accept it. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, you know, I fought back quite a bit. 
you know, I, I argue the, you know, the same things, you know, he's, he's a boy, you, you know, he, he's just taking a little longer, you know, he's got older siblings. Um, but so it was around two with the youngest. And then, um, the oldest, the 15 year old has had an ADHD diagnosis since, uh, around the first grade, I think. Um, and he was always just such a fun, spunky, wild, energetic kid that we kind of just went, it's okay, man. It's, it's who he is. And he's, he's, he's fun. Uh, but when he got into those teen years, we started seeing a lot more, um, uh, the sensory side of it with him. Um, and that really prompted us to get his diagnosis at 14. So what was the process like for you guys? Um, I was just talking to a mom yesterday and, uh, they first noticed symptoms when he was about 15 months old, but it, it ultimately took until he was almost six to get a diagnosis because of wait lists and, uh, you know, the whole like, well, he's a boy, let's give him another 18 months to, you know, whatever. Um, did you guys, was it like a smooth process for you guys or were there delays or how did that go for you? Um, we, you know, with the, with the youngest, um, being diagnosed at two, um, there weren't a lot of delays. Um, that was, he's 13 now. So that was 11 years ago. Um, so he, his, his diagnosis went pretty smooth. We had to take him. I don't remember, uh, crossover into Kansas. We live in Missouri. We had to go drive three or four hours to take him to have his testing done. Um, and that seemed to go pretty quickly. The 14 year or the 15 year old now, uh, when he was diagnosed last year at 14 was a way different situation. Uh, there were waiting lists. Uh, we had to, uh, get on a list to wait, uh, to have his test done. And then even after his test was done, uh, we were trying to get it before school started. I remember, and, uh, we ended up having to call the psychologist office and all these places and make all these calls and be like, Hey, we really need this before school starts because he was, uh, he was going to be a freshman that year. Uh, he's a sophomore now. And we really wanted the high school to have that diagnosis. So that way all of his IEP stuff and everything could be, I don't know what the correct word is, but I guess justified, um, uh, in their eyes to, to say, yes, he has this diagnosis. Yes. He needs this time. Yes. So, well, I think what you mean is like, um, like you want the IEP to reflect what his needs are so that he's getting the help that, that he needs. And if, if he needs more help and the ADHD diagnosis isn't like justifying that in their eyes, you need to, we need to know all the facts in order to match it with a resource, I guess is what it comes down to. Um, yeah, absolutely. How, so there, there seems to be a, a difference in the way moms and dads sort of handle that initial right diagnosis and, and like processing that. And so like you, you said you like, you were more re resistant to it. Like, um, was it just n not wanting to see it, I guess, or was it, was it just like, you didn't see it? Um, I'm curious. Well, I'm just curious because like, I, I was going to, I'll share what mine was when you're done. And I, I kind of feel like maybe we were on sort of the same page with that. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, there was an episode, I think it was an episode that you sent me, um, uh, and there was a dad that was talking, um, maybe something with the Ohio, Ohio government or something. I don't remember. Um, his story was a lot. I can't think of his name, but his story was a lot like mine. It was, you know, you kind of lose that that image that you have of your kid, you know, doing all the things that you thought they were going to do. Um, power sports is, is huge in, in our family. Um, four wheelers, motorcycles, side by sides. And just, you know, to think of that that, you know, he's probably not going to be able to ride a bicycle or, or motorcycle or a four wheeler. Um, you know, those, those thoughts that you have for your kids when they're younger, you start to see that kind of like much like he did in a way fade away. Um, he was, uh, you know, one year old running around having fun. And then he kind of just went into his box, um, you know, and that he wasn't talking anymore and he wasn't making eye contact anymore. And, um, you know, the things that his older brother was doing, you know, we're outside throwing the ball around or, you know, he's riding a four wheeler. Um, he can't do those things by himself. And I think as a dad, you see that disappear and you kind of see your, your child disappear a little bit in a way. Um, and that's just really hard. And, and I just, I, I guess, you know, having two boys, I always thought they were going to be the Duke boys, you know, they were going to rule the world and flatten the hills Reason and straighten hell, yeah. the curves. Yeah. And I guess it just kind of went, wow, you know, it's, it's probably not the way it's going to be. Um, fortunate enough for me, um, 
my wife is the opposite. Um, my wife was the one who, um, I don't want to say raised them because obviously I was there in the middle of it all too, but I was working an eight to five job at the time. And so she was home with them. Um, and she just refused to not do things. You know, she took them to Walmart. She took them to the store. She took them to the mall, um, took them clothes shopping. Um, you know, and then of course, when I was off work, we were, we were taking them out to places to eat dinner and, and, you know, sometimes it was really hard and sometimes it was, you know, almost <laughs> traumatizing sometimes. Um, but we got through all that. Um, now that they're older, we still do those things. We still take them, you know, we take them out to dinner. We try to go once a week or once every two weeks to go eat dinner. Um, I remember haircuts were just oh full haircuts. <laughs> I mean, we've done everything from take the padding out of the car seat when he was little and strap him in. And, uh, at the time we had a barber, um, who had a family member who had autism and she didn't care. She was like, bring him in. I don't care if he's kicking and screaming. We'll do whatever we have to do to get his haircut. And um, now at, at 14, um, he just walks right up, sits down in the barber's chair. Um, I have to remind him to keep his hands inside the cape. But uh, other than that, you know, he usually sits there and, and lets the barber cut his hair. Um, she's got a very specific way she does it. She starts with the biggest guard and works her way down for him. Mm -hmm. um, that helps him, I think, just to realize that it's okay. Um, getting around the ears is still hard, but, um, he does really well with that. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess it's just really, I fought it in the beginning and then once I accepted it, it kind of became our mission. So, and, you know, thank God for my wife for really making me see that and, uh, never giving up on me or the boys and making sure that they were in the community. And what do you think it, like, what do you remember? Like, a, a like, can you pinpoint a time or like something that occurred where it was just like, um, where like you, you realized that you accepted it or where like things changed for you? Yeah. Um, I, I can think of a couple instances really, um, when the youngest started school, um, when he went into first grade, um, my, both my boys are in public school. All three of my kids have went through public school. We have a great school system here and a great district. Um, you know, once they were in those, uh, those schools, and I was able to see the youngest, especially um, inclusion started for him in the second grade. He had a great second grade teacher, a regular ed teacher, where he would go into her classroom several times a day, sometimes even start the day there. And that's when I really, we really started to notice like the interaction with him and the other kids. Um, and that really started to put things into focus that, um, you know, he's, he's not any different. He just needs things differently. He needs to communicate differently. And I think that really started to push me to go, okay, you know, like this is important. And then the, the other, the other time that I really noticed was with the older son, um, with ADHD before his autism diagnosis, um, that he was playing sports and things were starting to get hard for him. Um, you know, the, there was coaches that were maybe not willing to work with him as much because he wasn't as complacent. And I really started to realize like, you know, he, he does have special needs. He's, he has to take time to process. He has to understand things uh, differently than the other boys do. And I think those were really the two moments that kind of shifted me to start to realize like, okay, yeah, they, they need, they need help and they need, they need special help and they're going to need, um, you know, a support system bigger than just mom. <laughs> I, you know, with my kids, well, all three of mine were diagnosed. Um, they're all very different. So like my oldest regressed, he experienced just massive global regression. So he developed typically until he was about three or four. And then it was like, put him to bed one kid, he woke up somebody else. Like, and, and that process was really hard for me because I, I, I grieved the loss of a child that I still had because he was so different that it was like, it was just hard for me to accept that. So like we spent a long time trying to figure out what happened like put a name to what it was that triggered everything because maybe we could fix it, right? So like you go through that whole thing because he wasn't born that way. And, and so it, it seemed like something happened and we needed to like fix that, if that, if that makes sense. And sure. ultimately you can't, like there was, there was nothing to fix. It was just one of those things that nobody can explain. My other two were diagnosed later because um, they came along later. My youngest was nonverbal, so... When he was diagnosed, I didn't recognize it as autism because I, I knew what his brother, his oldest brother had was autism. I didn't realize that it could be like that profoundly different. And then 
after he was diagnosed, I thought, okay, like this is autism and this is autism. And so my 18 year old, my middle child kind of fell through the cracks. Like I didn't, I didn't recognize it. And then when someone would start to like suggest something, I would push it away. I'm like, like, nope, that is not, I don't want that for him. Like, this is not, I don't see it. I was absolutely in denial. And I remember his preschool orientation when he was interacting with like classroom peers for the first time. And I watched him, uh, like play off by himself, lining up the cars and stuff like that. It was like, I got hit by freight train. I broke down and started crying. I had to walk out of the room. Um, because I felt so guilty that I hadn't, I hadn't recognized it because he could have gotten help sooner, you know? So I think we all kind of go through that, like that process of either accepting a diagnosis or recognize or allowing ourselves to see that there's something that requires an evaluation. I guess if that makes sense, because none of us want our kids to have to struggle or to go through things. And I mean, people don't like labels and, and whatever, but it, it is, you know, once you reach that point where you accept everything and you're kind of just moving forward, it's such a, it's such a better experience for everybody. I, I think it's just hard to get there for some people. It is. I, I share a post every year on social media. Um, it's a picture of both boys. Um, it's, it's pre what I call pre autism. Uh, pre the diagnosis. Um, they both have got their little electric four wheelers. Um, they're in the backyard. They both got on blue jeans and cow. I could see it in my head, blue jeans and cowboy boots. They've got on their t-shirts and they both got scrag, you know, kind of rough, straggly hair still because mom hadn't, you know, like, Oh, let's go get their haircut. You know, they're so cute. You know, and I, I share that picture every year and I, I share the story every year of this was for us before autism. And it's such a powerful image for me because I grew up um, with, with, uh, friends and, and family that, that were in power sports and into in four wheelers and we all rode together and we all did all these things. And it's really the last picture I have of the two boys together, um, pre autism, you know, and, and they ride at the point, uh, the youngest at that point wasn't necessarily riding the four wheeler really well, but he knew he could push the button and make it go and he could kind of steer. Um, but it's really the last time that I remember thinking of, of the boys before autism. And I think, um, Every year, it's a great reminder to me that, you know, hey, just because it didn't start this way doesn't mean it's not going to end that way. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight every day to to raise awareness and to raise inclusion and to really push uh, not only our boys and our kids, but the entire school district, the entire community um, to really care for and love all people with special needs, whether it's our boys or, or any child in the district or community or person. How are they how are they doing now? Uh, you know, both boys are doing really well. Um, the youngest had a phenomenal year last year. Um, our junior high is one of the uh, Special Olympics unified uh, programs. They have a unified banner school. Um, they have breakfast club once a week. They have unified PE. Uh, he had an awesome buddy last year, and I, I I have time. I want to share this story real quick too. He he got this he got this buddy last year. Uh, she he got a buddy. She's a girl, and. Um, they really bonded. Like she just hangs out with him and she, you know, she doesn't try to push him a whole lot and they became really good friends. And, and what's really wild about this is that, uh, through their friendship, my wife and I actually became friends with her parents. Um, and it turns out they live in the same neighborhood we do. We have two neighborhoods that connect where we live and they live on one side and we live on the other side. And we didn't even know who these people were, uh, but through this program and be between them being buddies, um, we met them and uh, we got to be friends with them. Um, we have an autism ride in April in Wynoke, Oklahoma. Um, and uh, that's where the sand dunes are in Oklahoma. And uh, their family actually was planning on buying a side-by-side. -side. They went ahead and bought their side-by-side -side and actually came to the ride last year. Um, it's about a four or five hour drive from where we live. So uh, they packed up their family, brought their side-by-side -side and rode with us. Uh, camp just a couple spots down from where we were camped. And so it's it's kind of wild to think that this unified program, you know, not only is it helping the kids in the school and the school district and the staff, but it's helping parents too. Uh, we wouldn't have known them, and we might not have been friends with them if it wasn't for that. That connection is really important, e even even if they don't have a child with autism, but like their daughter is really good friends. Like that, just having people who understand and accept and embrace and support and love and all that stuff and that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's amazing. They're super cool. Um, they she turned fourteen last summer. Um, they invited him to the birthday party we took him. 
Uh, I don't know if he's ever been to a birthday party that wasn't family before. So, I mean, that was huge for us this summer. And of course he did great. Uh, all those kids know who he is. Um, he's, he's probably the most charismatic kid we have. Um, the youngest he's, he's very outgoing. Uh, he wants to know everybody and, um, you know, so he's doing really well. The the older in high school, um, it's his second year of high school. It's going way better than the first year. Um, high school's hard. I mean, high school was hard for me, so I don't expect yeah. it to be easy for them. Um, but he's doing really well this year. Uh, he got involved in Special Olympics. Um, he was a great athlete when he was younger. Um, that kind of kind of came to an end because of autism. He just couldn't participate the way the coaches wanted to he couldn't do some of the things fast enough whatever um he couldn't process some things um and so that kind of went away for a few years but um he's running track in special olympics he won four gold medals at state last year wow um, yeah so um he's kind of you know it's one of those things with him where we we wanted to get the diagnosis earlier and this kind of ties back a little bit but we wanted to get the diagnosis earlier, but we kind of wanted to wait till he was old enough to understand it. Um, he's our middle child. He didn't necessarily fall through the cracks, but we kind of looked at him differently. And, um, you know, once we thought maybe he could handle the diagnosis of autism, that's when we started to, to do the testing to do the, um, and to get the, the, the process started. Um, and we tell him all the time, like you're in the middle or you know, your sister's neurotypical and your brother's little you know a little deeper on the severe side you're you're in the middle not only are you in the middle as a middle child but you have some of each of them in you and that's really the way we try to tackle it with him very cool i you know i think everybody has to do what they feel is right for their kids i mean i i don't i don't ever think there's like a one size fits all approach and you know i'm glad that you guys are able to get everything that you needed to get done in the time that you you know, wanted to get it done or when you felt it was the right time and everybody's doing well, that's amazing. I mean, that's a good, that's a good, I mean, that's a good story. I mean, it, Thank like you, man. it I is, appreciate it's, that. A, it's a good, yeah, you guys have done a good job. Um, I wanted to ask you also uh, about, so all of this stuff that you've been through, right? All this experience, everything else led you to start something. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I would love to, man. Um, it, it's crazy. You and I, I actually emailed you to ask you if you would come and speak at an event that we're going to host. And you turned it around on me and asked me to come on to the podcast, which is super cool. And thank you for that. Um, sure. We we have a nonprofit. We're a 5013C official out of Joplin, Missouri. Um, it's a nonprofit organization called Ride for Autism Awareness. Um, it actually started back in 2020. Um, it started a little differently than most nonprofits probably. Um, I had an uncle that passed away. And in lieu of flowers, the family asked for donations. And then my aunt turned to me and said, we're doing donations for something to do with autism. And uh, my wife and I were both floored, um, one, because we, two, one, we, we, were, we were excited to get the donations, but we had no idea what we were going to do with them. Um, so once uh, the funeral was over and we had the money, we went to the school district and said, hey, uh, we have this money to donate, but we really want to make sure that it goes to special needs programs. And they said, okay, well, let's get you in touch with the special needs director and administration. And so we went through all that and we made our first donation in 2020 from our, from our family. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where the roots began. But when it started to grow was in 2021, we bought our first side-by-side -side and we went to an event in Winoka, Oklahoma at the Sand Dunes, Little Sarah Sands, uh, uh, little Sarah sand dunes and the event was a fundraising event for a little girl with cancer and the people that were organizing the event they had a poker run and different things to do and then they donated the money they raised to the family of this little girl and after the event was over that night we were sitting out and i was talking to the guy that had started uh had, that was running the fundraiser had organized it and i was asking him how much money he made you know they made and how great it was that they did this and I had just simply said, man, it wouldn't it be really cool if we got everybody together on a Saturday night and had everybody turn their their rock lights and their LED lights and all this stuff on their side by sides blue and we rode through the sand dunes. And he just looked right at me and goes, Let's do it. Let's do it in November. And so we had our first ride for autism awareness uh in November of twenty one. Uh we had, I don't know, probably two, three hundred side by sides come out on a Saturday night. 
and uh, we rode through the sand dunes and it was really cool. We thought this was like the coolest thing. Like what a way to raise awareness. Like all these side-by-sides lined up with this blue glow underneath them. And we thought it was so cool. We had like, we had uh, glow necklaces and glow bracelets and stuff that we handed out to everybody and we sold t-shirts and uh, it didn't really hit us until we got home that following week and we got on social media and all the videos that people started posting. And um, like these videos are just, you know, all these side by sides going through and we're like, this is really cool. And we will maybe we should do it again next year. Well, during that time, I got a phone call from a a great friend of mine, Corey Osborne, uh, who is also on our board. And he's like, dude, we got to do a motorcycle ride. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know anything about motorcycle rides. I mean, I've had motorcycles, you know, my whole life or whatever, but I don't know anything about organizing one. And so in August of 22, we had our first motorcycle ride out of Joplin. And uh, the really cool thing about this motorcycle ride is, is that we don't stop on the ride. And I, that's super cool because it, it, it gives the opportunity from for a seasoned rider who rides every day to somebody who maybe only rides once in a while uh, to come out and ride and feel safe in a pack because we don't have to stop. And uh, it's all a testament to Corey getting a hold of law enforcement and firefighters and fire departments. Uh, we go through three states. Um, we start in downtown Joplin, Missouri. We leave one of the main arteries out of Joplin. Um, we have a police car in the front of our line and a police car at the back. And as we're going through intersections, um, they just park a, a cop car there and turn the lights on and people stop. And we just get to go right through. So uh, we go through Joplin. We go out of Missouri. We go into the corner of Kansas. Um, where we're located is Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Arkansas are all right there together. Um, so we go into Kansas uh, and we go into this small town in Kansas called Galena, Kansas. As we're coming down the hill into the town, a fire truck pulls out in front of the line and leads us through town. And it's like a parade. Um, and it's really wild to think um, we're in our third. This is our third year this year. And people actually will park on the side of the road. They, they know what day it is and they know they're coming and they'll get their kids out and they'll wave at us as we go by. And they're you know taking videos with their phone. And uh, it's, it's really grown. So the first year, I think we had like 150 motorcycles. The second year we had um, somewhere around 200, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, the second year was also a memorial ride. Corey's dad had passed away that year. So we did ride for autism awareness uh, in his name. And then last year we had over 400 mo- motorcycles, actually just this August. So just last a month or so ago, uh, we had over 400 motorcycles and over 300 people. Um, it's grown from just a ride from point A to point B to uh, really to an event. Um, after, after we landed this year, after the ride finished, we got out, um, we went inside a banquet room and we had lunch and, uh, we had our raffle, we had all our prizes. and We did some speaking, not a whole lot, but we talked about some of the things that, uh, the nonprofit does. Uh, what are some of the things that you guys, uh, do like, how, how do you raise awareness aside from the motorcycle? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously 400 motorcycles going down the road is going to raise some, some pretty crazy awareness, but, um, we've done a lot of things in the past. Uh, the first year we donated money to the school districts. Um, we just, uh, we've got probably three, four, five school districts in in our immediate area that we donated to. Um, after the second year, we did these picture communication boards. Um, like we have behind us, we did over 25 of those. Um, that actually started a friend of mine had posted one on Facebook. And said, wouldn't it be really cool if all our schools had these? And I immediately got on the phone to the board and said, hey, um, this is a really cool idea. Check this out on Facebook and let's see what we can do with this. So uh, I Googled them. They're really expensive. Um, And I I knew right then that uh, that's why our school districts didn't have them. It's because they may not have had the money to purchase them. So I reached out to a local company that prints uh, vinyl and decals and shirts and said, hey, I've got this idea for these, these picture communication system boards. How much would it cost to print them? And they told me the, the cost. And I, you know, we put them on aluminum and we, we drill the holes and put the grommets. And, but he said, but I don't know if you can use those symbols because they're probably trademarked and copyrighted. Um, and this kind of goes back to the whole, you know, the reason my wife and I had kids with autism possibly is that God knew that I'm the type of person to just ask. And so I got on the phone and I, I called Picture Communication Systems and said, hey, this is what I want to do. And I know it's crazy, but I really want your permission to use these symbols. And they said, yes. Um, they told me as long as I wasn't selling them, that I could have uh, the trademarks and copyright for a year. And so we produced, I think, 27 of these boards and donated every last one of them to a school district and uh, to a playground. 
Wow. That's very cool. How's that yeah. feel? Oh, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's cool. Uh, these boards are so unique. I know that they're all over the place, um, maybe in other places, but they're, they're not here and now they are. Uh, but the coolest thing about these boards, I think is not only do they help, uh, maybe a child with special needs or with a communication barrier, but the awareness and the inclusion that they bring, uh, to the other students, um, and the education they bring to the other students, um, to teachers, to staff members, to administrators, volunteers, anybody that might be on that playground, you know, they now know that there are kids here with special needs. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they see a kid that's communicating with a peer, uh, you know, using this board, um, that that's, that's awareness and, and that's inclusion at its, at its chorus level. And I think it's just, they're just amazing. And I hope we can do so many more in the future. That's really cool. And I always love when like parents, like a lot of these things, when they, when they start or born by parents, right? Like, uh, you know, they, they have that lived experience and they want to make a change or do something different so that other people can benefit from it and make the world a better place and all that stuff. That's very, very cool. Um, how can people find you guys? Uh, sure. We're on social media. It's Ride for Autism Awareness. It's R-I-D-E, the number four. AA is most of our hashtags. Um, our website is uh, ride for autism awareness.org. Um, and it's F O R or, or the number four, either way. We have both of them now. When we started, uh, the F O R wasn't available. And over the last four years, it has. So we've, we've picked that up. Um, Google search will bring you to us. Um, we have donation links on our website. Um, donations always welcome. There's information on there. Um, I need to add. I need to add you on there and put links to you on there because we appreciate you. And, and I know you're, Thank you. you're helping us out uh, with this. Um, I did have a quick little blurb. Um, you sure. said something about you love it when parents step up and do this, uh, do things like this. Um, actually, I'm a graphic designer. That's actually my job, uh, my real job. And uh, I actually had a lady reach out to me. Um, I think they're out of uh, Wisconsin. And she was like, would you make a logo for our nonprofit? So even more connection and networking just because she had saw our, uh, our logo and our nonprofit. And now uh, we, I made her logo for their nonprofit and uh, they're doing great things up there in Wisconsin uh, to raise awareness and inclusion. That's really cool, man. It's very, very cool. Um, I really appreciate you being here and, and sharing your story and all the stuff that you guys are doing with um, your nonprofit. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, you know, figuring out, like being able to come out there and, and meet you guys and have some fun and raise some awareness. I think that'll be, I think it'd be a blast. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it, man. Like we're just in the very early stages of the gala. Um, like I said, it's our third year. So, you know, we're, we're growing as a nonprofit, we're growing as a brand. And, uh, I think that, uh, one more ride next year. And then I think we can, we can push towards that gala and, and have you come and speak. And that, that'll just be amazing. man. I know that there's so many people that are going to be looking forward to hear you. Well, thank you again for everything. I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'll have all your information in the show notes so people can just click and, and, and find you guys. Uh, thank, thank you again. You. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, man. And again, thank you for all you do uh, for all of us in this community, especially parents. Um, I mean, I've listened to you for a long time. There's a lot of days I've been like, I can't do this today. And I, I could throw your podcast on and go, man, I'm, I'm not the only one. I appreciate that. I'm glad. I'm. It feels good. I'm glad that. Uh, I'm glad that it helps. Well, God bless you, sir. Thank you. You too. Before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and for all the support you guys have shown me over the last seven seasons. I am so grateful and appreciative of each and every one of you. If you have found this useful or you just enjoyed listening, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever app you're listening to this on or share it with your friends or whatever, uh, it's a great way to support the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys can reach me at the autismdad.link. That's the autismdad.link. And we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.